thanks to King's College London for the invite. Uh, it is an honor to be here. Um, I will do my my normal disclaimer that I'm, I'm appearing in my academic capacity and, and by no means speaking on behalf of the Office of the Prosecutor. Um, I, I will speak for probably 45 minutes, um, give us plenty of time for a conversation afterward. I, I imagine and hope that the presentation will elicit some, some comments and questions. So um, I look forward more to that than actually giving the lecture, but of course I have to give the lecture for you guys to, uh, um, to be able to, uh, to respond to it. So um, I want to begin with what I think is the most remarkable statement by an international law association that I have ever seen. Uh, this one made by the board of the European Society of International Law early last year in response to Russia's unprovoked and criminal invasion of Ukraine. And you can read it on the slide. Now, do Western violations of international law justify Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Absolutely not. But is it, quote, morally corrupt to highlight those violations because they are, quote, an irrelevant distraction? Well, I don't think so. Uh, and more importantly, because no one care, really cares what one lefty international lawyer believes, states in the global south don't seem to think so either because they have proven much less willing than Western states to hold Russia accountable for the invasion. Now, consider the voting patterns in the General Assembly over the past two years. When states have simply been asked to condemn Russia's aggression, they have done so in large numbers. For example, one week after the invasion, states adopted Resolution ES-11-1 by a vote of 141 in favor and five against, with 35 abstentions. But when states have been asked to impose actual consequences on Russia, voting has been far more fractured. Resolution ES-11-3, which removed Russia from the Human Rights Council, was adopted by a vote of 93 states for, 24 against, and 58 abstentions. The resolution thus passed with less than an absolute majority of the General Assembly, 48%. And, this is very important, consider the geographic distribution of votes. 61% of the states in Africa, 40% of the states in Latin America and the Caribbean, and 63% of the states in the Middle East either voted against the resolution or abstained on it. By contrast, 100% of the states in the Western Europe and others group voted in favor of the resolution. Now, the voting on Resolution ES-11-5, which calls for the creation of an international reparations mechanism, was very similar to the voting on Resolution ES-11-3. Now, the West to South disparity is even more stark when it comes to prosecuting Russian leaders for the crime of aggression. The Friends of Accountability, a group of states that is committed to creating a new criminal tribunal for the invasion of Ukraine, has been meeting for more than 18 months and now has 47 members. Of those 47, a grand total of three are from the South, and none of those Southern states are from Africa, Asia, or the Middle East. We should, of course, always be skeptical of monocausal explanations of state behavior, particularly when we're talking about groups of states. And it seems clear that the South's reluctance to punish Russia is political as well as legal. The goodwill that many African states still feel for Russia because of Soviet support for decolonization, for example, obviously plays a role. Uh, Kevin, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It yeah. seems that we cannot see your, yes, now we can see your slides, okay. Somehow. Wait, you can't, you can't see my slides when I'm, now we can. Now we can. We stopped at the French of uh, accountability. So here okay. it, it's, we can see them now. We lost it for a second. Apologies uh, for that. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, I'm an international lawyer, as you know. So I want to focus today on international law. More specifically, I want to defend two interrelated claims concerning the South's seeming reluctance to hold Russia accountable for the invasion of Ukraine. The first, is that Russia's legal rationales for invading Ukraine are within the boundaries of plausible argument because, and only because, the West has for decades systematically ignored the South concerning the use of force. The second is that the lack of support for prosecuting Russian leaders for invading Ukraine is at least partially due to the West systematically ignoring the South concerning both the definition of aggression and the creation of institutions to prosecute it. Now, my story I want to emphasize is not simply of one of Western double standards. The West is hypocritical, clearly so, but the problem is not that Western states have engaged in the same kinds of unlawful uses of force as Russia. The problem is that they have so fervently argued that their unlawful uses of force are actually lawful, that the ad bellum permits them 
to use force in the ways that they have. Simply put, and this is my central thesis today, those arguments have created a use ad bellum regime whose invocation by Russia, despite being made in evident bad faith, enables the South to justify remaining neutral between Russia and the West. So let me start with the use of force. The European Society of International Law did not simply describe comparing Russia's invasion of Ukraine to previous Western uses of force as morally corrupt. It also condemned Russia's arguments regarding Ukraine as having, quote, no basis whatsoever, whether in fact or in law, and as a, quote, cynical and perverse use of international law. I agree that Russia's claims are factually meritless. The same cannot be said, however, of its legal claims. To the contrary, far from being perverse, the legal rationales Russia has invoked to defend invading Ukraine actually fall well within the argumentative boundaries that Western states have established. Let's consider those rationales. Uh, the tour will be quick, but I hope it will be enlightening. First, Russia has repeatedly argued that its invasion of Ukraine was a lawful act of individual self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter. As Putin said in his infamous February 24 speech, Russia had to invade Ukraine because it could not exist, quote, while facing a permanent threat from the territory of today's Ukraine. The correct response to this claim is a simple one. Ukraine never attacked Russia, and self-defense is not available in response to threats of future attacks. If the West had taken the South seriously concerning self-defense, that would be the end of the argument. As we all know, Article 51 says, if an armed attack occurs, not if an armed attack is going to occur. Southern states have insisted literally for decades that Article 51 must be interpreted restrictively as prohibiting any kind of anticipatory self-defense. And let me just offer you three snippets of evidence. First, during the drafting of the Friendly Relations Declaration and the definition of aggression, very few states, overwhelmingly Western, defended the legality of any kind of anticipatory self-defense, even in response to imminent armed attacks. The vast majority of states, overwhelmingly Southern, insisted that Article 51 meant what it said and that the article's reference to the, quote, inherent right of self-defense did not change the analysis an argument that is correct, by the way, if you examine the travaux preparatoire of Article 51. Second, during the Cold War, Southern states repeatedly condemned anticipatory uses of force by the West, most notably in 1967, in response to Israel's invasion of Egypt during the Six Day War. Third, in 2005, when the UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, asserted that self-defense was permissible against imminent armed attacks, the non-aligned movement, representing 117 states from the Global South at the time, publicly and angrily rejected his position. Indeed, NAM's representative specifically decried the fact that despite its members representing two-thirds of the United Nations, quote, the ideas and observations submitted by NAM have not been taken into consideration in the Secretary General's report. For these reasons and many others, a few Western international lawyers, such as Tom Rees, Christine Gray, have concluded that no form of anticipatory self-defense is currently lawful, but they are decidedly in the minority. Most Western lawyers, and certainly most Western states, take it as a matter of faith that at the very least self-defense is available in response to imminent threats, the Caroline Standard. If Caroline imminence represented the outer limit of anticipatory self-defense, Russia's self-defense claim would still be well beyond the boundaries of acceptable argument. But of course, the most powerful Western states have not been content with ignoring the 130 plus states who reject any kind of anticipatory self-defense. They have gone further. Now, sometimes their efforts have been relatively modest limiting themselves to endorsing self-defense in response to imminent threats, but stretching the definition of imminence well beyond the Caroline standard. Thus the statement on the slide offered in 2004 by the Attorney General of the UK, a definition that, as Christine Gray has noted, effectively renders the imminence requirement a dead letter. But even that has not been enough for some Western states, Israel and the US in particular. In 1981, for example, Israel attacked an Iraqi nuclear reactor in Osirak while it was still being built. Israel made no attempt to argue that an armed attack by Iraq was imminent. It simply claimed that it had the right to act in self-defense because the reactor would eventually produce nuclear weapons that Iraq could use against it. 
Now, the General Assembly condemned Israel's attack by a vote of 109 for and two against, Israel and the U.S., of course, and 34 abstentions. But that did not dissuade the United States from affirming the legality of non-anticipatory self-defense two decades later in its infamous 2002 national security strategy. This robust endorsement of preemptive self-defense was not a one-off that the U.S. cynically invoked to justify the invasion of Iraq. Not only did the 2006 national security strategy make the same claim, the U.S. has gone even further in the context of self-defense against non-state actors. Who, for example, can forget this gem when a Pentagon spokesman was asked in 2014 what armed attack justified striking the Materius Khorasan group in Syria? Now, neither the UK's endorsement of non-imminent imminence nor the US and Israel's, quote, bad dude theory of non-anticipatory anticipatory self-defense is consistent with the USAD bellum. The point, however, is not that such defense, that such self-defense is lawful. The point instead is twofold. First, that Russia's expansionist position on self-defense in Ukraine bears an uncanny legal resemblance to the expansionist positions taken by the UK, Israel, and the US. And second, that those expansionist positions are legally cognizable only because the West has ignored the South's decades-long insistence on reading Article 51 restrictively. Russia has also justified its invasion of Ukraine as collective self-defense of the People's Republics of Luhansk and Donetsk. This claim should be easy to dismiss because it is black letter use ad bellum that only a state can request collective self-defense, and there is no coherent argument that either the LPR or the DPR is a state. Both are, quote, independent of Ukraine, only because of Russia's previous unlawful use of force, and both are completely dependent on Russia for their continued existence. But even here, there is Western state practice that smudges the black letters. Consider the Vietnam War. The U.S. justified its bombing of North Vietnam, Operation Rolling Thunder, as collective self-defense of South Vietnam. The Lawyers Committee on American Policy Toward Vietnam, whose most prominent member was none other than the arch-realist Hans Morgenthau, challenged that justification, arguing that South Vietnam was not a state because it was completely dependent on the U.S., a position shared at the time by nearly all of the states in the global South. In response, the U.S. acknowledged that South Vietnam, quote, may lack some of the attributes of an independent sovereign state, but it nevertheless insisted that it was a, quote, recognized international entity and was thus entitled to ask for and receive outside support. Now, Russia is also hardly alone in prematurely recognizing the statehood of various political entities. To take only the most obvious example, the US, the UK, and France recognized Kosovo the day after it declared independence at a time when Kosovo did not satisfy the Montevideo criteria because of its dependence on the UN and NATO, and it was lex ferenda to claim that a people, which the Kosovars were not, were entitled to external self-determination if they had been the victim of human rights abuses. Even today, despite the West treating Kosovo's statehood as essentially a fait accompli, only 101 of the world's 194 states have recognized it, 38 states less than have recognized Palestine. And nearly all of the holdouts for Kosovo are in the global south. A third Russian rationale for the invasion of Ukraine is that it was acting to protect its nationals from harm, Russian passport holders in Donbass in particular. States in the global south have insisted for more than a century that they do not accept protection of nationals as a legitimate exception to the prohibition of the use of force. Consider four quick examples. In the 1950s, southern states specifically rejected the exception during the negotiations over what would become the definition of aggression. Second, southern states reiterated their objection during the negotiations over the International Convention on the Taking of Hostages. Third, numerous southern states spoke out against the exception during debates over the ILC's draft articles on diplomatic protection. And fourth, and perhaps most important, southern states have consistently condemned specific Western uses of force directed at rescuing nationals, from Israel's raid at Entebbe in Uganda in 1976 to the U.S.'s invasion of Panama in 1989. If this was the only state practice in Impinio Juris we had, Russia's protection of nationals argument would be as legally problematic as it is factually problematic. But once again, Western states have weakened the legal case against Russia by ignoring the South. In all of the venues just mentioned, and from Entebbe to Panama, 
Western states, and here particularly the US, the UK, Belgium, France, and Israel, have repeatedly insisted that using force to protect nationals is an inherent part of the right of self-defense and thus lawful. Like Tom Rees and Christine Gray, I think they are wrong about that, but the West has nevertheless opened the legal door to the argument and Russia has enthusiastically strode through it. Now, before moving away from self-defense, I want to say a few words about annexation. Resolution ES-11-1, supported by both Western and Southern states, explicitly condemns Russia's annexation of various parts of Ukraine, and rightly so. It's worth noting, though, that the U.S. is hardly opposed to territorial annexation, at least when the annexer is one of its allies. In 2019, the U.S. recognized Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights, which Israel seized from Syria in 1967, and in 2020, the U.S. recognized Morocco's annexation of Western Sahara. The U.S. made no attempt at all to offer a legal justification for Western Sahara. As for the Golan Heights, it invoked the almost universally rejected concept of, quote, defensive annexation. The idea that it is legally permissible for a state to annex territory as long as it occupied that territory defending itself against an armed attack. Or, as noted international lawyer Benjamin Netanyahu put it more concisely, quote, if occupied in a defensive war, then it's ours. Now, the fourth and final Russian rationale for the invasion of Ukraine, and perhaps the most notorious, is humanitarian intervention. To quote Putin again, quote, the purpose of this operation is to protect people who, for eight years now, have been facing humiliation and genocide perpetrated by the Kiev regime. I've written extensively about why unilateral humanitarian intervention is both unlawful and criminal. Suffice it to say here that no state in the global south has ever affirmed the legality of intervening for ostensibly humanitarian purposes without the blessing of the Security Council, and more than 140, including the entirety of the non-aligned movement, the Arab League, and the G77, have explicitly and repeatedly condemned such interventions as unlawful. Now, fortunately, unlike many Western scholars, Western states overwhelmingly agree here with the South. But even here, there are exceptions. At various times, the UK, Belgium, Denmark, and New Zealand have each claimed that humanitarian intervention is lawful even without Security Council authorization. That alone weakens the legal case against Russia's invocation of it. NATO's unlawful intervention in Kosovo, however, is even more legally debilitating. As you no doubt know, the Independent International Commission for Kosovo, so international that one of its 10 members was from Africa, Latin America, or the Middle East, infamously described the intervention as, quote, illegal but legitimate. That phase adequately describes the positions most NATO states took before and during the intervention insisting that they were acting for purely humanitarian reasons while refusing to formally assert the legality of unilateral humanitarian intervention. That kind of manipulation of the use of bellum, so patently instrumental, undermines the West's ability to dismiss Russia's humanitarian intervention claim as legally meritless. So that's the use of force. I want to turn now to the crime of aggression. The West might have unclean hands, but it is absolutely right to insist that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was a criminal act for which Russian political and military leaders must be held accountable. As I noted earlier, though, states in the global south have been very reluctant to impose actual consequences on Russia. Not only have they opposed or abstained in large numbers from General Assembly resolutions removing Russia from the Human Rights Council and calling for an international reparations mechanism, they have shown almost no interest in working with the West to create a new criminal tribunal to prosecute Russian leaders for aggression. If that is the case, I would suggest the West has only itself to blame. For decades, the West resisted Southern efforts to define and criminalize aggression. For decades, the West, led by the United States, used force against the South in ways the South considered criminal without even a whisper of accountability. Iran, 1953, the Dominican Republic, 1965, Nicaragua, 1984, Iraq, 2003, and on and on and on. It is only now, when a political and economic rival invades a West-leaning state, that the West has suddenly rediscovered the importance of the crime of aggression. And unfortunately, and I mean that sincerely because it is unfortunate, it is almost certainly too late. Simply put, if you ignore Southern voices long enough, you should not be surprised when they refuse to heed your call. Let's start with definitional issues. 
The West likes to take credit for creating the crime of aggression. And there's no question that the US, UK, and France played an essential role in ensuring that the crime was prosecuted at Nuremberg. For the next seven decades, however, Western states bitterly opposed any attempt by the international community to define aggression in a manner that could conceivably be applied to them. Indeed, as Omar Ba has explained, the South had to drag the West kicking and screaming into a general definition of aggression, and the process took nearly three decades, floundering until the General Assembly finally adopted Resolution 3314 in 1974. Western states only supported Resolution 3314, however, because they were able to neuter it during the negotiations. To begin with, the UK insisted on inserting, quote, a war of at the beginning of Article 5.2, which defined the crime of aggression. Before the change, all of the acts in Article 3 would have qualified as crimes against peace. After it, only one act did, classic interstate wars. Even worse, Western states made sure that the definition of aggression would not have any independent legal force. They did so by insisting on including Articles 2 and 4 in the resolution, which together make clear that the Security Council is not obligated to deem any particular act aggressive, even one in Article 3. Now, the definition of aggression is not the only example of the West ignoring the South concerning the use of force. A few years earlier, when negotiating the Friendly Relations Declaration, a group of southern states, Algeria, Burma, Cameroon, Benin, Ghana, Kenya, Madagascar, Nigeria, the United Arab Republic, and Yugoslavia, introduced a joint proposal deeming, quote, economic coercion, a critical Western tool for maintaining dominance over newly decolonized states, a use of force that was capable, if serious enough, of giving or triggering the right of self-defense. Now, Western states made sure that the proposal went nowhere. The West also ignored the South during the long process that led to the adoption of the Draft Code of Offenses Against the Peace and Security of Mankind in 1996. Between 1983 and 1996, Southern commissioners succeeded in getting the ILC to include in the code a variety of crimes particularly important to states in the South, such as colonial domination, apartheid, mercenarism, and drug trafficking. The Western commissioners bitterly opposed each and every one of those crimes. And by the time the code was adopted, only war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and aggression were left. We call these four, of course, the core international crimes. That description itself reflects the marginalization of the South and international criminal law. Those crimes are core only because the West succeeded in making them so. Now, many Western states, particularly the ones with a permanent veto in the Security Council, would have been very happy if the crime of aggression had remained nothing more than an article in the ILC draft code. But that was a non-starter for states in the Global South, who were all too aware of the limits of the Friendly Relations Declaration and the definition of aggression. They wanted a crime of aggression, and they wanted it to be contained in a legally binding treaty. So they pushed for it again and again from the earliest negotiations in Rome in 1998 to activation in New York in 2017. Now, the adoption of the aggression amendments at the ICC is a genuine success. It is nevertheless important to acknowledge that the crime of aggression in the Rome Statute is but a pale shadow of the crime that most Southern states envisioned. Indeed, I predicted in an article a few years ago entitled, quote, Who is Afraid of the Crime of Aggression, that the court will never witness an actual aggression prosecution. And I stand behind that prediction. Why is that the case? Because the West wanted it that way. Once they realized that an ICC without the crime of aggression was a non-starter for the South, Western states went from opposing the crime to attempting to neuter it. And neuter it they did. I don't have time to discuss every aspect of the crime of aggression that represents the triumph of Western states over Southern ones, so I'll limit myself to mentioning two of the most important, one definitional, one jurisdictional. The definitional limit is the manifest violation requirement in Article 8 bis 1. During the aggression negotiations, Southern states wanted to make up for the limits of the definition of aggression by criminalizing all of the acts listed in Resolution 3314, not just wars of aggression. They lost that battle because Western states, led by the United States, insisted that it was not enough to violate the prohibition of the use of force in Article 24 of the UN Charter. The use of force also had to be a, quote, manifest violation of the Charter by its character, gravity, and scale. 
Western states insisted on including the manifest qualifier in Article 8 bis for a very simple reason. They wanted to make sure that their uses of force, particularly anticipatory self-defense and unilateral humanitarian intervention, could never be deemed the crime of aggression. The U.S. was particularly shameless in this regard. Concerned that the manifest qualifier would leave too much discretion to the ICC's judges, it tried to explicitly exempt humanitarian intervention from the crime of aggression by introducing an understanding that would have prohibited the court from finding a manifest violation when it was, quote, objectively evident that a use of force was intended to prevent international crimes. That understanding was overwhelmingly rejected by the Assembly of States parties, particularly by states in the Global South. Undeterred, the U.S. then proposed yet another understanding, one that would have required the judges to consider a state's motivation for using force when deciding whether an aggressive act was a manifest violation. That proposal also failed. We will probably never know whether the manifest violation requirement will exempt Western uses of force from the crime of aggression, and that's because of the jurisdictional limit the West coerced the South into accepting, namely the exclusion of non-member states. The ICC has jurisdiction over war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide when they are committed on the territory of a state party, even when the perpetrator's state is not a member of the court. Now, Southern states wanted the same jurisdictional regime to apply to aggression, but Western ones, led by the US, the UK, and France, but with the support of Australia and Canada, made clear that they would rather the aggression negotiations fail completely than give the court the ability to prosecute non-member states for aggression. As Robin Cook, the British Foreign Secretary, revealingly admitted at the time, quote, this is not a court set up to bring to book prime ministers of the United Kingdom or presidents of the United States. Had the West listened to the South, instead of insisting on excluding non-member states from the crime of aggression, the international community would not have needed to spend the past year trying to find a way to prosecute Putin and his minions. Even worse, some of the same individuals responsible for kneecapping the ICC now cite that kneecapping as a reason to create a new special tribunal for the crime of aggression. Gordon Brown, for example, the former prime minister of the UK, recently described the ICC's inability to prosecute Putin for aggression as a, quote, jurisdictional loophole, conveniently failing to mention the central role that his own government played in opening that loop in the first place. Now, there is, of course, another reason why a new aggression tribunal is necessary, the permanent veto at the Security Council. The Council could refer Russia's aggression to the ICC, but Russia would veto it. The Council could also create a new tribunal that every state in the world would be obligated to cooperate with, but Russia would veto it. I'm sure you know, the permanent veto is the price that states paid to get the P5 to support creating the UN. And the P5 has bitterly opposed efforts to reform the Security Council ever since, being particularly dismissive of the non-aligned movement's regular calls to either eliminate the permanent veto or add two new permanent members from the South. The P5, other than France, have not even been willing to consider a collective and voluntary agreement among themselves to never veto a resolution that is intended to end mass atrocities. And of course, one member of the P5, the US, has routinely used its permanent veto to frustrate one of the South's key priorities, namely holding Israel accountable for its permanent occupation of the West Bank and its unlawful annexation of other states' territory. Over the past 50 years, the US has vetoed 81 resolutions in the Security Council, more than double the former Soviet Union and Russia combined. 42 of those 81 vetoes have concerned Israel. It's impossible to understand the South's reluctance to get behind Western efforts to hold Russia accountable for the invasion of Ukraine without considering these indignities. Those who live by the permanent veto die by the permanent veto. Now, let me conclude by saying a few words about why the West's decades-long silencing of the global South concerning the use of force is so important. I am not going to give you some flowery, impassioned defense of a restrictive reading of the use ad bellum, as if Russia would not have invaded Ukraine if only the legal case against anticipatory self-defense was clearer, or if only the ICC had broader jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. I don't believe the use ad bellum has that kind of power to constrain and deter, particularly when it comes to the use of force by powerful states. But that doesn't mean that a state's ability to provide a cognizable legal justification for a use of force is irrelevant. 
On the contrary, international relations scholars have long pointed out that in our heavily juridified age, legal rationales for the use of force have a much greater valence than rationales that are more nakedly political or even ethical. To be sure, the argument can easily be overstated. The world's most powerful states, the US and China, do not always have to justify their uses of force because the appearance of legality is often irrelevant to their ability to exercise power. The US's attack on the, Sh on the Shira Air Base in Syria in 2017, which it did not even try to legally justify, is an example. Russia, however, is not the US or China. As Anastasia Kotova and Dina Tsuvala have recently pointed out, Russia is at best a regional imperial power whose political, economic, and even military influence has declined precipitously over the past four decades. Russia's repeated failures in Ukraine, revealing its military to be a little more than a murderous Potemkin village, attest to that fact. What this means, I would suggest, is that Russia does not have the luxury to ignore international law, even when it is so obviously flouting it. It can invade Ukraine, but it cannot do so with the hegemonic silence that is the privilege of its more powerful rivals. It must cloak its invasion of Ukraine in a veneer of use ad bellum respectability. To be sure, that veneer can be easily stripped away by even a modest application of factual scrutiny. As I said when I began this lecture, Russia's factual claims are meritless. In some cases, such as its claim to be, quote, denazifying Ukraine, comically so. The West, however, is not Russia's audience. The global South is. And herein, I think, lies the importance of Russia's legal arguments. They enable Southern states to justify what Jorge Heine, a Chilean ambassador turned scholar, has called active non-alignment, not picking a side in the war in Ukraine in favor of building bridges with both sides. Southern states have little to gain politically or economically from joining the West in its crusade to hold Russia's leaders accountable especially given that China is Russia's most important ally. At the same time, though, as scholars like Sabenjamin Traore have, and Alonzo Germendi have noted, the South has always been far more committed than the North to the prohibition of the use of force, to the territorial integrity of states, and to the crime of aggression. How can states in the South, in good conscience, ignore what seems to be such a blatant violation of every international law principle that they have traditionally held dear? The answer, I believe, comes from that clever little qualifier, seems to be. Russia's legal rationales for invading Ukraine are not important because they convince Western lawyers like us or even Western states like the US. They're important because they allow Southern states to tell themselves and tell each other that they can remain neutral in the conflict between the West and Russia without abandoning their commitment, however strategic or imperfect, to a restrictive use of bellum. Let me be clear, I am not saying that Southern states believe or accept Russia's legal claims. The vast majority are almost certainly as unconvinced by them as we are in the West. But those legal claims don't need to be convincing. They simply need to be good enough for the South to justify its act of non-alignment. For that limited purpose, Russia's legal claims are good enough. And why are they good enough? because they are the same legal claims the West has been making for decades to justify its uses of force, almost always over the bitter opposition of the South. And because the West is no will less willing than Russia to invent whatever facts are necessary to support expansive legal claims. Who can forget, for example, one of many possible, President Bush's oft-repeated claim in 1990 that Saddam Hussein had ordered dozens of babies pulled from their incubators and left to die. Had the West taken the South's views on the use of force and the crime of aggression more seriously, the use of bellum would look very different than it does now. Different enough, in fact, that Russia's rationales for invading Ukraine would be so legally beyond the pale that southern states would find it much more difficult to rationalize refusing to heed Western calls to punish Russian leaders for their sins. So, to conclude, if the South's neutrality concerning accountability for Russia is a tragedy, and I would argue that indeed it is, it is a tragedy largely of the West's own making. Thank you. Uh, wow. wow. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kevin, for this uh, um, very rich uh, presentation and uh, very strong argumentation. I'm pretty sure that our audience will have many, many questions and comments, and I, I have as well, but I would like to give the floor first to our audience. Um, I don't know if you if you want to remove your slides so you can I don't know if that's an option you know so you can see more people. Yeah, um, let me I, mm, stop sharing. Um, 
<laughs> Sorry, we're yeah, teams. Okay, great. Okay. Perfect. Uh, but I would like to encourage uh, our audience, people who attended your um, uh, your presentation, to raise questions, comments, and even you know to to take the floor. You can raise your hand and take the floor and comment and ask questions. You can throw things at your own screen since you can't. <laughs> yeah, that's true, you know, as well. So, who would like to take the floor first, please? I'm pretty sure we have many. It's impossible not to have so. Uh, many questions about your um, observations. Or I'm so incredibly convincing that everybody is just stunned into agreed upon silence. That can be also the case. You know, that's another explanation. Uh, anyone, please? Wow. OK, then maybe, you know, I can take the floor before uh, before other people step in and I'm um, there is a lot of discussion about the language of international law and how it is used and abused. You know, uh, some of the critical legal scholars say it's not abused, it's just interpreted a different way. And uh, from the beginning of your presentation, you, you, you say, you know, how Western states try to present um, unlawful acts as lawful using the language of international law. Um, and, and this is something, you know, that we have seen also that the language of international law remains. Russia used the same language of international law. And actually, you know, there was also these uh, um, comments and observations, but you did the same thing. I have a question because, you know, it's a, it's a personal question. It's something that I'm very troubled. We spend all these years, scholars, everyone, this is a question I raised to everyone, talking about the crime of aggression, the importance of the crime of aggression. And I feel we're in a parallel reality here. We did the crime of aggression, you know, as, as the prohibition of aggression is being peremptory norm. You know, we talk about use cogens, we talk about our government's obligations with some um, hesitations. And then after the activation in the wrong standard, we say this is a new legal reality that uh, also influences uh, neutrality and other sub themes of international law. And personally, I, I, I don't know, I feel I'm, I, I have this um, inconvenience. I understand, you know, your arguments about the global south and how they can be a kind of neutral or non aligned. Still, legally, normatively, have we made any change at the end of the day? How all this fuss about the crime of aggression? <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, I mean, we have made some progress, right? I mean, the international community argued over aggression with very little success for 70 years. Um, we did ultimately settle on a definition of aggression. Uh, you know, if I was the, the king of international law, would I would I accept exactly the same definition that we find in the Rome Statute? Probably not, but it's pretty close. It's a good definition. I think it's a definition that most states would be able to agree on. The devil, of course, <laughs> is in the jurisdictional details. Uh, I, I think it is important that the aggression amendments were adopted. I think it's important symbolically that we have kind of um, concluded the legacy of Nuremberg by finally adopting a definition of the crime of aggression. But of course, we have, at least in terms of the one extant international organization, effectively neutered <laughs> that crime. Um, you know, as I said during the presentation, I, I, I seriously doubt any of us will ever see uh, an aggression prosecution at the ICC. And if you go and you look at the, I think it's either 44 or 45 states that have ratified the crime of aggression, um, good luck finding, you know, a state on that list that's going to invade one of its neighbors. Um, but it's still, it's still not nothing. And, and, and I think that it's not nothing in the sense that if you look you know, I think over the next couple of years, you will see a lot more states, probably in the north, in the west, um, ratifying the aggression amendments because of that need to not appear too overtly hypocritical. It's very hard to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine as the crime of aggression when, even though you're a member of the court, you have refused to ratify the aggression amendments. And so there's a number of states, in, you know, particularly in the, in the Scandinavian um, region of Europe and in other parts of Europe, that I think will ratify the aggression amendments over the next few years. And, and I think, that, again, that's a testament to the symbolic importance of the crime. But in terms of actual prosecution of aggression, you know, it is not <laughs> evident what avenue one could pursue to really do that. Um, you know, I don't want to get into the whole definition, you know, the whole argument about the special special tribunal. But, you know, 
it is uh, the the combination of of important symbolism and extremely hazardous great power politics. Um, but of course, we never get away from that <laughs> in international law. And aggression, I think, makes that point with particular clarity. Thank you. I see we have Christopher Poole. Chris, would you like to to take the floor, please, for a question? Uh, yeah. First of all, um, you know, thank you so much for 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 the presentation. It's it, it, very 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 enlightening. Um, you, you know, if I may, you know, the parties you mention are are Russia, the West, and the global South. I mean, one pretty important actor missing from that list is Ukraine itself. Um, Ukraine has been, you know, quite understandably, one of the uh, chief advocates of of these, these sort of legal um, initiatives. Um, and I wonder to what extent the Global South sees Ukraine as being part of the, the West. And, and one thing that I'm noticing is um, the more that the Global South engages with Ukraine itself, the more um, the, the more that the, 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 the Global South or, or you know, elements of the Global South uh, see some sort of um, similarities with Ukraine's position in terms of being, um, you know, the subject of colonial uh, colonial attack. Um, you know, I, I can't say too much about it, but that there are initiatives being being made to connect, you know, civil society groups in the global south with Ukrainians themselves, and um, I, I suspect that that this may kind of um, you know, develop some some of the some of the legal initiatives that are that are being put forward. No, I mean it, it's a, you know it's an incredibly important point and, and question. Um, you know, in terms of kind of Ukraine's role in in the various kind of you know again oversimplifying categories that I use. You know, I would just I would strongly recommend Patrick Labuda's writing on the treatment of Ukraine as you know in its colonial past. Um, I don't agree with everything that, that Patrick argues, but he makes a very powerful point about you know, how we should think of Ukraine um, and its own legacy of being you know, essentially colonized. Um, you know, in terms of aggression, um, Ukraine is essentially, I think, caught, <laughs> you know, in this much larger web of, of power politics, um, as, I, as I tried to imply in the talk. In the abstract, Ukraine should absolutely be a situation to which the global south, and again, oversimplifying, is committed. Um, you know, and and again, I recommend Benjamin Traore's writing on the very, very long, unbroken dedication of states in the south to the prohibition of the use of force and territorial integrity and the crime of aggression. It would be hard to imagine a situation in a, you know, relatively Western state that would appeal more to the long-standing sensibilities and commitments of the South. But the South is also trapped between the great powers in terms of Russia, China, and the United States. Um, and I think that, again, I'm, I'm just using the, you know, the writing of, of, of others, um, but this idea of, of active neutrality I do think it explains a lot. I don't think the states in the in the South don't view Russia's invasion as the crime of aggression. I am quite sure that almost all of them do. But the question is, do they have anything to gain by getting on board these Western initiatives to punish Russia when they're the ones whose populations are going to starve to death if there is no grain shipped out of Ukraine? You know, it's a simple to me, a simple kind of weighing of priorities that they put their more immediate political and economic needs over their kind of more abstract international law commitments. Um, but that's not an easy thing to do. If you've spent 70 years constantly advocating for the rules that I think the West has diluted, it is hard to just say, well, we care more about our, our, our economics now. And that's why I argue that, that that's the role that these rationalizations play, that it allows them to maintain a veneer of respectability by saying, oh, it's actually fairly complicated, you know, um, 
the, the, the legal case, not the factual one, because those are the claims are so absurd, but that the legal case is just, you know, it's an open question whether Russia is really like violated these these principles. And again, I think they know that they have, but it'll again, it allows a certain kind of cover to them to not have to take sides in the battle that they don't get anything out of. There is nothing in it really for many states in the South to see a new tribunal created that will almost certainly never actually have anyone in the dock to prosecute. Um, so I think that's the, the argument that I have been trying to to build up. But we, you know, I don't want to strip Ukraine of agency. You know, I, I would love to see a you know a, a widely supported legitimate mechanism to prosecute uh, you know Putin and others uh, created. Uh, you know, one supported by states in the South. I'm just skeptical <laughs> that that will actually happen. Uh, I can see we have uh, comments, questions in the chat, so I'm going through them. First, um, while I'm going through, I saw Eva and another participant. I will give the floor to Rachel, Rachel Kerr, uh, who is in the audience. Rachel, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Oh, you can yep. see me as well now. <laughs> Hi. Cool. Thanks, Maria. Thank you, Kevin. Hello. Um, it was a great talk. I, I was sort of, sort of prompted to ask my question because I'm sitting here thinking pretty much the same things as Eva and I saw Eva's message in the in the chat and it's really a question and I thought oh should I ask that because it seems a bit kind of open-ended and maybe um, but quite close to what, what Maria was asking as well. It's just this sort of sense of well what do we do? What do we do with all of this? Um, are we in a state you know what what do you see as the end game? of this is there an end game or do we just keep kind of bumbling on saying well the law the law is the law and we can sort of chip away at things and look at aggression for example in the examples you gave you know maybe more states will ratify but in the end it will be those states that probably aren't going to go and invade another state anyway so you can't really i mean that's not much of a deterrent um impact so and you know is the do we just accept, I suppose, do we just accept the limitations of the law um, and the, you know, the, the way that it's bound up in politics, which, which is, um, or is there, is there a different end game in sight? Um, and in that context, would a, you know, what you sort of mentioned the, the, uh, the potential for a tribunal, would that help? Um, and if so, what would need to happen to get there? to get to a tribunal that's going to prosecute Putin for aggression? Um, or is there another another avenue that might be more conducive? For example, could we use it, could could the ICJ be used and would that have an impact? Um, so sorry, that's a bit of a kind of bumbling mm -hmm. wide-ranging question, but it's just this sense of um, I just would like to get your views on kind of where we are and do we just kind of accept it and shrug our shoulders again and say, well, this is the way that this is the way that international law operates and you kind of chip away and chip away and things get slightly better, but then they get worse again and then they get better again and we'll just look at it. Or is there a different end game in sight? Oh, that's an easy, easy question, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I want to say something, you know, kind of wonderfully optimistic, but it's not really my nature in, in, this, in this particular area. I think it's also misplaced. I mean, it, it's... It's difficult to see, uh, you know, anything particularly progressive happening in the use ad bellum. We seem to be unfortunately going the opposite direction. Um, I, I suppose, you know, and I, I try to do this in a lot of my writing, um, just to emphasize that there is so much kind of untapped legal power among states in the South that are not being taken advantage of. There's a lot more states that we could consider Southern than we could consider Western. Uh, they're not all as powerful as you know the, the China's and the US's, but from a legal standpoint, in a world where we still have to at least you know, tip our hat to, to sovereign equality, um, there's lawmaking power there. Um, the biggest problem that I see in the use of bellum is just the kind of lack of interest in the actual details. You know, I mean, there's a reason why I'm an old fashioned positivist. I'm an old fashioned positivist because positivism gives us a language that can be used to discuss and argue about and make legal claims regarding international law. If 
law is just power, if we're just supposed to look at law as the, the social practices of elites, well, then the powerful states are the ones who are always going to make law because law has just become synonymous with power. If we actually think that legal rules exist, in, you know, independent of the practice that gives rise to them, and we believe that you do actually have to find state practice in opinio juris behind certain extensions of the law, we can have, a, I think, a constructive argument and, and show why the U.S.'s claim to be able to use the force on any territory that is unable or unwilling to deal in the U.S.'s view with a non-state actor, we can show how that actually has an incredibly weak pedigree. You know, we we can say, no, there's not state practice in Pino Uris. You, you can't just simply use this force in light of the fact that for decades, states in the South have been insisting on not expanding the, the UN Charter or on reading it restrictively. You never eliminate power that way, of course, but at least it gives you a vocabulary to make claims and to articulate a, hopefully a common position. So we need to make the West defend their uses of force in the vocabulary that is recognized by international law. And we need states that are in the South to be more assertive and aggressive in, in making counterclaims and, and, and requiring those claims to be made. And again, there's a lot more states in the South. And I, you know, I, I published an article a couple of years ago on the on specially affected states. And, and everybody has kind of always treated the concept of specially affected states and the formation of custom as literally just another tool of hegemony. You know, the US claiming it's specially affected by everything because it's just so powerful. That's not the way that the doctrine works. <laughs> uh, it's not the way the doctrine should work. And you know, I advocated in that article that 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 states in the South should insist on the ways in which they are specially affected and their particularly important role in the formation of custom. Will they do that? I don't know. They're not listening to me. I don't, you know, I don't pretend to have that much influence, but it's out there. These concepts are there. The USAD Bellum are, you know, it is a set of rules that that come from somewhere and that we can argue about. And I think we need to do more of that. Um, you know, in terms of the tribunal itself, I mean, you know, states have been trying for quite some time <laughs> to, to create a tribunal. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've, I've participated in, in some of those debates. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard to see, you know, a, a way to put Putin in the dock. It's, you know, I do think the argument that, you know, a, a widely accepted General Assembly resolution asserting the right to create an international court that didn't have to recognize personal immunity, I think it works. But again, notice what the proponents of that are doing. They're not saying we need 140 states representing all of the four corners of the earth to join this resolution. They say, no, no, all you need is it. you just need it to pass. Or, or, you know, a couple scholars have said you only just need 60 votes as long as it passed. So less than one third of the entire UN's membership, again, which will almost overwhelmingly be northern states, will be able to create a tribunal that set aside personal immunity. Well, how do you justify that when you have a, essentially an entire continent of Africa, the African Union collectively opposed to even the ICC <laughs> setting aside the personal immunity of, you know, the, the head of state, the head of government and the foreign minister? That kind of incredibly ends-driven, pragmatic view of the law, I think, does more harm than good in the long run. Um, so I think it's exactly what you or actually what the previous commenter said, which is they need to actually do the hard diplomatic work of getting states in the South to support some kind of non-overtly selective mechanism to prosecute Russian aggression. Because again, I think they understand and accept that it's aggression. I think in the abstract, they would like to see it prosecuted because it does reflect so many of their deep-seated beliefs. But there has to be a persuasive uh, legal mechanism, and it also has to take into account their own need to make sure, again, that the grain keeps flowing um, and to not piss off China <laughs> too much. Um, so, you know, I, I have no great answers or, or great uplifting speech to give, but but I do think there are tools out there that could be made use of in a, a smarter way than, than we've seen them used. I don't think that's really an answer to your question, but I don't, that's because I don't think I really have one, Rachel. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin and Rachel. I think uh, you responded to Eva's question as well. Uh, we have a, com a question on the chat, so I ask Anna, who wrote the comment, to take the floor. Uh, Anna, are you with us? Can you take the floor? 
Yes. Hi. Uh, hi. Hi. Thank you, Professor Hala. Um, I thought that presentation was excellent. And I, for what it's worth, I completely agree with basically everything you said. Okay. Good. Um, Let's I do... move on to the next person. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have one one question. I think the my perception of, of of what you said was that it was a little bit light touch on the autonomy and the responsibility of southern states in the Ukraine and Russia conflict. Um, I, from what you've said, I, I think it's surely the case that the global south is being just as problematic and hypocritical um, by failing to condemn conduct which in other circumstances they have condemned um, when it was coming from the west and, and you say that the, the west has sort of set up the scene for the south um, to kind of benefit from this exp expansive view of, of self-defense um, and collective defense and so forth um, but the south is still choosing to adopt that expansive view rather than doubling down on their kind of long-held um, conception of aggression because it suits them to be neutral now because of siding with with Russia and, and China um, and so what I wonder is you know without for example the war on terror would you know would you really be able to say that the South would actually be condemning Russia if we hadn't had this expansive sort of rhetoric 20 years ago 30 years ago would they really be seeking accountability for for Russian war crimes from day one um, and frankly, you know, are, are the South's political gains any less justified now than the West were 20 or 30 years ago? Um, you know, this sort of game for tit for tat, is, is, it really, is it really right at this point to kind of just blame the West for, for what we're seeing and this kind of lack of, of, um, of, of condemnation from, from the global South? And then if I may, another question, very briefly, in this kind of um, sort of utopia of a, a permanent fire world with no with no veto um part of the issue that that we have here is 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 russia is sort of coming up with these claims that that justify its its turning to the um imminence and anticipatory self-defense of this being Nazi and, and all of these claims that we've heard before um but if we had a p5-less world would it be an insecurity council without a p5 um Sort of judging the veracity of these claims who would be the ones to say well no wait a second you can't move forward with these what you're saying is it just doesn't add up so what what would be your your conception in this kind of vetoless world also two difficult questions um uh, you know on the first one um i i don't want to make too much of my argument <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe my argument, but I, I don't want to say it's like some master narrative that explains everything. Um, I do think it is interesting that when you look at the two or maybe three votes in the General Assembly where it's just symbolic condemnation, you do see a tremendous number of states, uh, including in the in the South, um, voting for them. And that's like, you know, ES 11 one where they condemn the, the invasion or, you know, another one where they condemn annexation. So. When it's just symbolic, you know, they they stick to their kind of traditional view uh, that's quite restrictive of the use of bellum. It's when they call for consequences in the General Assembly, resolutions that are introduced by Western states, that they seem to get cold feet. Um, and so I, I think the validity of your point is that it is not evident that they're very kind of real politique, political and economic interests would be any different if we had a much more restrictive use of bellum. Uh, it is very possible that faced with a choice between, you know, a really clear affirmation of, of a USAID bellum that reflects their ideas and grain being sent, they would still go with the grain. They may very well. I, I would be foolish to deny that. Um, but I do think that it, to some extent, <laughs> matters that they have arguments to invoke or, you know, a, a vocabulary or a set of arguments to justify not taking sides. Um, that, I think, is the tragedy of, of kind of the expansion of the use of Bellum. It just makes it too easy <laughs> for them to say, you know, these arguments are all complicated. There's a, a 
you know, open argument for legality. Let's not talk about the facts too much. Um, and we'll just stay out of it and let China and Russia and the U.S. fight about it. So, again, I don't want to overstate it. I'm, you know, um, I, I always think, of course, in the end, the the specific economic and political and various other interests of states will, will rule out. But unless we don't think that international law as a rhetoric has any importance in international relations, then I do think it matters at the margins. Um, with your second question, um, sorry, just repeat the second, just one sentence, second question again. I couldn't hear any of that. Maria, do you remember what the second question was? Yeah, we did not hear you very well. I think it had to do the veto, right? And the oh, right, veto. What? Sorry, thank you. What, what the world? Of, um, well, I mean, okay, <laughs> we're obviously in the in the realm of science fiction. I'm. I, I would love, you know, every, every state in the world other than the P five to en masse withdraw from the UN Charter and then immediately start UN two point with no permanent veto, um, but. You know, if the world would look different <laughs> without the without the permanent veto, um, you know, I mean, the reason we have to spend so much time, you know, uh, talking about the how to create a special tribunal is the fact that the General Assembly, which is the only democratic forum at the UN, doesn't have coercive power. It can recommend, but it can't order um you know and 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 so the the one institution that does have some binding force is completely dominated by the p5 and so right off the bat we know exactly what is and is not you know cognizable within the realm of you know kind of international reaction to things like atrocities um so you know um would it be a better world if there was just a general assembly and no security council i don't know <laughs> Probably, uh, it would create some of some some questions of its own. But I do think that whatever validity there was to giving you know the victorious allies permanent vetoes right after World War II, uh, although again largely at the you know uh, point of blackmail, <laughs> um, you know the world has changed, <laughs> and you know if, if there is going to be a permanent veto. It can't be monopolized by just the same powers in 1949. I don't know who I would give the permanent veto to. I mean, there's, you know, Germany, uh, you know, Brazil, India. I mean, there's South Africa. There are some other major players. And I think the problem, of course, is just the, you know, we don't live in a bipolar world like we did in during the Cold War. We don't live in a unipolar world of U.S. hegemony at the, after the collapse of communism. We live in a truly multipolar world that is not reflected in the Security Council. And I don't know whether we're actually taking into account that multipolarity would make a better world, but at least from a decision-making standpoint, it would be more fair. <laughs> um, you know, but we have the Security Council and there's nothing that we can do with it. And I get, I get, you know, the tip of my hat to my friend, you know, Tamsin Flipa Page, you know, I get very frustrated every time I read some blog post, oh, let's throw the Russia out of, you know, out of the Security Council, or let's strip the US of its veto. I mean, we can all think that that's a wonderful idea, but it just doesn't work because of the UN Charter. So, um, yeah, that's my extremely inadequate answer to your second question. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin and Anna. Is there any other question, any comment? Someone who would like to take the floor? Okay, because um, if it's okay, I have a question. It was related, I think, to Anna's. It is a kind of uh, a follow-up. Um, Kevin, uh, I, I share with you a lot of the critique, and, and I think I really believe that the picture is way more nuanced. Uh, you mentioned previously the article by Patrick Labuda about colonialism, and, and I was wondering, um, there are many reasons, you know, how people, I will give the floor as well afterwards to the, to the other participants. There are many reasons, and you mentioned about that political, financial, historical reasons, how people, how states voted, you know, before the General Assembly. Uh, but you said, you know, that you you really believe, you know, that there is uh, this um, endorsement of the condemnation of the of the crime of aggression, you know, by the by the global south. So I was wondering, to what extent a more emancipatory use 
of the legal language by the global south would be also more beneficial to them instead of a, a non-aligned kind of abstention in their voting or in their condemnation of Russia's aggression. And I, I, my, because usually, you know, we, we go condemn, crit, criticize the West or the global North, whatever it is. But but what about, you know, if, the, if there is this legal condemnation about aggression, I'm talking about law here, you know, wh why, how beneficial is actually this position where you have this type of, I wouldn't call it neutrality, but abstention distance, you know, from the condemnation. And that comes to my second comment. There are some commentators, some discussion, although I think it's very unlikely that maybe all this critique and all this chaos with the crime of aggression in Ukraine, maybe that give a different push to a possible, you know, reassessment of the crime of aggression within the ICC Rome statute. Should some more states from the global south be more inclusive, more more active in this sense, you know, about this legal discourse? That's mine. Yeah. No. I mean, again, it's an excellent question. Um, but I think it partly this is what I'm trying to get at. That I would love to see states in the south be more aggressive in terms of promoting their legal claims and their legal interests. But they have been <laughs> for 70 years making the same points. They have insisted on, uh, on interpreting the Article 2.4 restrictively. They've insisted that anticipatory self-defense is not legal. They insist that humanitarian intervention is not legal. They assume that you know a self-defense against non-state actors on an unwilling or unable theory is, is not legal. And they're ignored. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, read any kind of Western law review, look at any debate in the West, it is just taken for granted. Well, of course you can respond to, to you know, uh, an imminent attack. Of, of course, you, you know, uh, you can use self-defense against a non-state actor. Of, of course, you know, on and on and on and on. So they've just been ignored. They were ignored about the charter and they've been ignored about the institutional architecture and even the very definition of the crime of aggression. You know, um, that's kind of what I was trying to show in the talk. So although I don't think that justifies just like giving up and and, and not making legal claims, um, you know, I, I think there's a reason why that, you know, faced with essentially a Western brick wall about all of their legal arguments for the past seven decades, they say, OK, well, obviously our views don't matter on the use of bellum, but we're going to make sure that the grain flows. Um, that's at least my sense. Um, that doesn't mean give up the emancipatory potential of international law. I mean, I think that is, you know, we can, I think all of us who are critically minded agree that international law is not primarily a, a tool for restraining violence. It's for, for authorizing and rationalizing and justifying it, but that doesn't eliminate the emancipatory potential. And, that, and that's kind of what I was trying to get at, I think, with my, my answer to your question earlier, that a concept like specially affected states which is seen as a tool of hegemony actually has incredible emancipatory potential within it if it's properly understood. If it's if, if we don't just accept the US and UK understanding of specially affected states and give a much richer one that's much more rooted in ICJ jurisprudence and also in basic logic that really says, actually, there's a lot of specially affected states out there. And particularly in the use of force, it happens to be the states that are being the objects of force and not simply the ones that are the authors of the force. Um, but we don't have have those discussions because that's not widely perceived. And I suppose that's a plug for my own article. But, um, you know, it, the emancipatory potential is there, but it takes a lot of skill <laughs> to mobilize. Um, yeah, I don't, again, I also I can't remember the last part of your. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, oh, that was especially given the momentum now or the last year, you know, talking about. Um... Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry. So, I mean, I, again, I want to give a happier answer, <laughs> you know, and and I, I don't want to dismiss <laughs> claims of people who I greatly respect but disagree with who say, you know, you have to start somewhere. Um, you know, let, let's let's use creating a truly international tribunal for Ukraine as a stepping stone to creating one that will, you know, um, that will be able to deal with Western uses of force. You know, number one, 
it's always let's make the first step the one that is what the West wants. It's never the first step in Iraq or it's never the first step in even like, you know, Rwanda and the DRC. It's always the first step that is the enemy of, of the Western states. Even putting that aside, you know, I just think we have to be a little skeptical if, you know, uh, of the idea that, that that many of the Western states that support an international tribunal are, are going to be as even handed when the next time that the U.S., you know, wrongly invades a country. Um, you know, I, I, I'm just cynical enough to think that, yes, it's nice to say that this is going to be a precedent for future international tribunals, but I don't think that is the case. Um, and which is why, in terms of the nuances of the debate, I've been arguing for, you know, an internationalized tribunal that I find much more likely to be created uh, for other situations than a full-fledged international tribunal that the whole international community has to be behind. And again, I don't, I don't have any, you know, belief that my concept or the internationalized concept is somehow some magical, you know, uh, remedy for selectivity in international criminal law. But I do think we have to think about what kinds of institutions are easier to create and more likely to be created politically, economically, etc., you know, in the future. And then I don't think the full-fledged Nuremberg 2.0 <laughs> is going to be the precedent that, that its supporters really think that it is. I hope I'm wrong. I really do. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe there is. A, it, I think it revives also the discussion about the ICC itself. You know, that's what I meant. Uh, for apart from the uh, from the special for the potential special tribunal, I think we have one more question. You know, uh, I would like the, to give the floor to Ian. Thank you. Hi. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, thank you so much. There's a lot to just a lot <laughs> to think about. Um, I, this is a bit of a departure from the discussion of like armed conflict per se, like physical conflict. Um, but I wanted to ask because Russia is known to launch cyber attacks and they've done so in this conflict. So what would kind of constitute a crime of aggression in the case of cyber warfare? And could you also comment on the sort of challenges to the legal framework um, with the rise of autonomous weapon systems, the use of AI in warfare, and by extension with it, you know, the difficulties of actually um, finding the people or this non-state group or the state group accountable? for what might be crimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, also complicated. Um, I don't think that there is any reason in principle that a cyber attack couldn't itself be an act of aggression. Um, I haven't, I have to confess, I haven't thought in any kind of systematic way through what that kind of cyber attack would look like, um, but I certainly think it's possible and, and certainly states you know, states are certainly largely on board with the idea that a cyber attack could be an armed attack within the meaning of the UN Charter, which would give rise to the self-defense, and that would be fairly close to an act of aggression. Um, as you said, though, I mean, in terms of cyber attacks, the issue, of course, is attributability, right? And, you know, it's it, it states... Even that, you know, even when we know a state is behind a particular cyber attack, there's a difference between we know it at a political or, or international law level and being able to prove it in for terms of state responsibility. So, as you know, I, I think cyber attacks with that are very clearly authored by states will be more part of an armed conflict as opposed to one that would initiate um, an armed conflict and thereby be possibly an act of aggression, precisely because they're so easy to, not easy, but because of the, the difficulty that other states have attributing them. Um, like we all know, you know, where uh, WannaCry came from, but we can't really prove it. Um, so I, I think, you know, we have to deal with cyber far more than we have. And just as an aside, as a little plug for, you know, the institution that I'm, I'm working for these days, um, you know the the OTP has has very um, has taken the need to think more about the way that cyber attacks function within the ICC than previously, um, and there will be at some point next year a new policy paper on on cyber attacks, and you know the court is very open to that. Um, in terms of autonomous weapons, you know, I mean, this is a really, you know, it's a really difficult issue. Um, 
it's difficult for me to talk about because I'm much less skeptical of autonomous weapons than most lefty international lawyers are, um, which I will not bore you with the argument. But I do think that Insofar as we believe that autonomous weapons are a danger, and I, and I think from a USAID Bellum standpoint, they really are. I do think it will make it easier for states to go go to war uh, because of the fact that they will, you know, force protection and minimizing civilian casualties on the other side. Um, but insofar as we think that they're really a danger under international humanitarian law or international human rights law, um, it's not going to be easy to regulate them. Um, you know, and if you look at like the Stop Killer Robots um, campaign or Future of Life or any of these groups, they always talk about, oh, you know, look at the landmine convention or look at the, the biological chemical weapons conventions. Well, <laughs> you know, there's a reason why a lot of states are willing to, 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 to ban biological and chemical weapons because they have essentially no military value at all. Uh, you know, unless you're a state that really doesn't care about how many civilians you kill, like Assyria, um, you don't want to use biological or chemical weapons. It's, there's, there's no need to have them in your arsenal, particularly if you're a powerful Western military. Um, look at the landmines one. I think you and I would probably agree that anti-personnel landmines are a terrible idea or cluster munitions we could include in this discussion, um, that they have very little military value, um, that they should be banned. I would love to see both of them banned. Um, but that isn't what states believe. States actually find that there is military advantage to landmines and cluster munitions. And so even though most of the world is perfectly happy to ban them, the states that still see them as having military utility and not an easy substitute with another type of weapon, they haven't joined uh, the cluster munitions convention or the landmine ban. Um, so the question is, is it, are autonomous weapons closer to chemical and biological weapons, or are they closer to kind of landmines and cluster munitions? And I would argue, actually more extreme, that they have much more military utility than even the landmines and the cluster munitions, which is going to make it even more difficult to convince not just the rogue states like Russia, who are, don't particularly care, will, will never care how they're used, but even the states that might want to use them responsibly, how you're going to convince them to give up an autonomous weapon that they see is absolutely critical to their military strategies going forward, I'm very skeptical that you can just say, oh, it's just like the biological or chemical weapons. Because they're gonna say, no, they're not. We don't need biological or chemical weapons, we need autonomous weapons. So I've been arguing recently, you know, that instead of having this big categorical Manichaean debate about whether we we ban all autonomous weapons or, you know, we allow all autonomous weapons, we really try to figure out on a granular level, both now and in the future, what do we think autonomous weapons can do as well as a human soldier or or better? Um, and what can't they do? You know, and if and if we have a granular discussion that focuses on their capabilities and on the capabilities of human soldiers in actual combat situations, maybe there will be a whole range of situations in which even the Russia's China's, US's, Israel's, UK's, et cetera, can agree that we should regulate them, not ban them, but say, okay, we won't use them in urban combat <laughs> until it is absolutely clear that they can discriminate between combatants and civilians as well as a human soldier can. Maybe we'll just limit them to combat at sea or combat in the air, where most of the issues that, that limit the, the, the legality of autonomous weapons are not present. You know, but I think we do a disservice by having this Manichaean debate where it's, oh, we just have to ban them forever, always, in every situation. No state is ever going to buy that with a weapon that has such evident military utility. So I, I don't know if that was really the question that you were asking, but because these are things I've been thinking a lot about, um, I think that's probably the best answer that I can give you. Thank you very much, Kevin. And if it's OK, we have a final question. Uh, uh, just before we conclude this wonderful discussion, Maya, you have the floor. Hi. Uh, hi, Kevin. Thanks for hi. the lecture. Um, you can hear me. I, I look yep. sideways. But, um, so I, I'm from Ukraine and I've been thinking a lot about, you know, our stand in this world dynamic. And um, I always feel like Ukraine is in this weird boundary between global south and west. You know, we're not in the global south, but we're also not part of the West. You know, we don't have the privileges of the West. And I also feel like the West just um, sort of, we've only been included in this idea of, you know, Western aligned 
you know, when we started dying for the Western security, right? And so I'm wondering uh, what you think, maybe not even from an international law point of view, but just from a diplomatic point of view of what Ukraine can do um, in terms of reaching out to Global South. I mean, Kuleba has been like finally opening uh, new like uh, embassies in places that we've ignored for a long time, like Africa. Um, and that's because, you know, uh, I think a lot of the Global South knows anything about Ukraine from the Russian perspective because we just simply have not been um, reaching out to the Global South at all. And now I think we finally realized that. I think it's too late and we are now being punished for it. And I'm wondering what you think that, you know, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian leadership can do to now correct this, but also still, you know, we have to kind of do what the West says in many ways now. We rely so much on it. So I'm wondering, yeah, what, what you think in this weird conundrum that Ukraine is in, what we can do. Thanks. I, I kind of just want to adopt everything that you said and say I agree with you, um, because I do. Um, what can I add? Um, well, I mean, I think the really important part is the the diplomatic part, which is the 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 more reaching out to, you know, states that Ukraine might not have had, you know, as long of diplomatic relations with or diplomatic not relations, but ties, probably a, a better term. Um, you know, I I, I I do think that and then I say this with great hesitation because I'm not Ukrainian and I completely understand, um, you know, the position of the Ukrainian government that, that there is to some degree need to moderate their legal demands in, in, in a way that makes it easier to, to build bridges with, with the South. I mean, the Ukraine, again, I completely understand why they want Nuremberg 2.0. I, I do not begrudge them in the slightest for wanting a true international tribunal. In a perfect world, they absolutely deserve another Nuremberg because this is the clearest act of, of criminal aggression that we've seen since World War II. And, and I say that, you know, despite the fact that I absolutely believe the invasion of Iraq was the crime of aggression, this is worse. Um, but I think because of the need to maintain their alliances with the West, particularly because it's the West that's providing most of the weaponry that, that Ukraine needs to defend itself, that they've given a little too much um, importance to some of what the West wants legally for Ukraine. Um, again, I understand why Ukraine, I'm not answering this question very well. Um, you, you know, I understand why Ukraine wants to see Putin in the dock. Um, I, I think everybody would like to see Putin in the dock. Um, it is not easy <laughs> to figure out a way to put Putin in the dock. And the way that Ukraine has pursued, largely because of the influence of, of some Western states and some Western international lawyers, is, I think, a way that is designed to antagonize states in the South that would be otherwise relatively inclined to support Ukraine in terms of its desire to see aggression punished. Um, I, I think that's what happened, this, this obsession with you know, finding some way to create an international tribunal that can set aside personal immunity when the entire African Union is opposed to that idea is not a good way to build bridges. I, I think it's a, it's a way to ensure that the South just doesn't really engage in these discussions. So it, I think there has to be some moderation of our kind of maximal ideas for international law, knowing that those ideas are not always shared by the entire world, and that sometimes you have to accept a suboptimal situation, such as creating a tribunal that cannot prosecute Putin while he's in power, um, you know, in order to build more bridges with states for whom that's a, you know, maybe totally Totally venal. They may be just that they want to protect their own leaders from prosecution, but is still a legal principle that they hold on to with great fervency. Um, you know, it may just be having to accept, okay, if we want to bring a number of African states on board, we have to accept the fact that the Security Council is the only way to create an international tribunal that can set aside personal immunity and that the General Assembly can only create one, um, you know, that, that puts aside functional immunity. Um, I don't know all the answers to that, but that's kind of my best sense that it's a very difficult situation for Ukraine to be in because they have to please the Western states that give them guns. And some of that pleasing makes it more difficult to build the bridges with the South. And I, I, I am not a good enough diplomat <laughs> to know how to thread that needle. Um, I hope that answers your question or, or some thoughts to your, doesn't answer it, but responds to your question. 
thank you, Kevin. I see there is a there is a comment on chat, but I think you actually that was your main argument. I don't, do you have a do you have the can you read the comment? You know the uh, final which, which one the, the, the long one at the, the end at the, the very last one by Anand. Um, oh yeah. Um, yeah. Which which pretty much I think this is your argument basically. Um, and um, no, there is no other uh, question. Just a couple of seconds to read it through. I, I mean, I, I think I completely agree with this. Exactly, <laughs> so, that, um, that was my reading as well, but. Yeah, no, I, I yes, yeah, so I, I completely agree <laughs> with, with that comment. And I yeah. think he put it better in the in the chat than I probably put it in my, yeah. in my presentation. <laughs> but um, yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah, let's say that's a summary of your comment, you know, of your argument, I would say. Uh, well, I was very tempted to ask you why you consider this time uh, the aggressive war in Ukraine worse than Iraq, but I'm not going to do that because we're almost over unless you want to. Uh, Only, you know, not so much. When I say I, I should, I'm glad that you asked me that because let me yeah. clarify what I mean. When I say worse, I'm not talking about the consequences mm. um, for people yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Iraq or, or Ukraine because the, I mean the, the the catastrophic effect that the criminal invasion of Iraq has had for the Iraqi people and for the destabilization of the entire Middle East. I'm not saying that that's less than or you know what's happened in 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 Ukraine. Um, what I'm saying is I do think, uh, you know. I will I will go to my grave <laughs> insisting that the invasion of Iraq was a criminal act of aggression as aggression was defined in customary international law in 2003 when the invasion took place. Um, but there are some nuances to that argument, the Security Council resolutions, et cetera, that makes it a tiny bit more legally complicated, where there is no complication at all legally in terms of the criminality of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, you know, they can they can invoke all the the you know, they can invoke these legal principles that the West has created all they want, but there's no factual basis for them. So that's all I'm saying. That we can we can denounce the clarity of of the invasion of Ukraine as being more obviously criminal than the US's invasion of Iraq, although, again, the U.S. invasion of Iraq was absolutely criminal. <laughs> so thank Excellent. you for the opportunity to clarify. No, no, th th thanks for this uh, final comment. Well, on that note, uh, I would like very much to thank you for this wonderful, uh, as I say at the beginning, reads, thought-provoking uh, discussion. Uh, and the last question by Maya uh, about um, uh, Ukraine's role or what should Ukraine do now? I think it was very much related, you know, to diplomatic efforts, to more persuasive efforts. And I would say also to more to wiser choices on behalf of the so-called West, uh, because I couldn't agree with you, a special tribunal now just for Ukraine. I don't think that it was a very wise uh, proposition in order to convince uh, states from the global south uh, about uh, the necessity and uh, and the Ukrainian and the Russian aggression in Ukraine. So we need a little bit of more ethical leadership and a wiser leadership uh, when they try actually to uh, to strengthen this emancipatory uh, role of international law. Because I agree with you, international law it's not all accommodates power, but there are some occasions where international law can have its bright side as well you know but we need better choices <laughs> in this <laughs> regard so uh, on that note i would like to thank you once more for your time for you. your for, for accepting giving up 90 minutes of their day to listen to me <laughs> I, I know you gave 90 minutes of your day to 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 present to to discuss with us I would like to thank Liz once more for accommodating this discussion. I would like to thank all of our participants and I'm looking forward to see you to our next seminar. And Kevin, hopefully we'll see you in person in London. I, I hope so. It's been too long. <laughs> yes, it's been too long, true. Thank you all very, very much. Have a great day. And Kevin, once more, thank you very much for that. Thank you thank all. Bye-bye. Thank you.